uh, excited to meet many of you, see some of you again, and to uh, talk about human rights. Let me um, uh, preface it, I think Sergei mentioned this, that uh, although everybody in here's English is better than my Russian, uh, there are various levels of English, uh, and if at any point uh, you don't understand something or you want to uh, ask for clarification, please inter interject, please stop me, or ask uh, Sergey to, uh, and we can um, uh, take a break, or Sergey can translate, or I can try and say things again. Uh, if I start speaking too quickly, uh, then slow me down, and uh, we'll work through it. Um, let me tell you my plans for the week. Uh, I'm hoping, I'll do some lecturing each day, but my aim is to try and provoke discussion. Uh, my aim is to try and get uh, some issues on out that uh, uh, you guys will want to talk about, and so we'll break into groups and, and talk about those things and then have question and answer afterwards. So in general, I'll probably start off with uh, some of my comments, uh, and then we'll break into discussion groups, then we'll come back and we'll uh, discuss those things. Today, I'll probably talk more uh, than in the other days. So what I want to do today is I want to give you my uh, account of a human right. Uh, and I hope to do that before we break into uh, groups. Um, with the hope that uh, you can say what's attractive or unattractive about it, what's right or wrong about it. But my account of human rights is not the most important thing I want to get across today because uh, I think that uh, the concept of human rights is what some people call essentially contestable or indeterminate. What that means is I don't think that there is a right or wrong answer to what is a human right. There are loads of issues um, that uh, people can, uh, reasonable people can disagree about, and depending upon what they want to emphasize, they may define a human right one way or another way. Uh, and so really, when you come up with your own conception of a human right, and it might be very close to mine, it may be very different, uh, it's going to be uh, a function, presumably, of what you want human rights to do, or, or how you understand human rights related to natural law, or state sovereignty, or individual dignity, things like this. And these are, these are a number of things. So anyway, that's what I'd like to do today, is uh, two things. I want to give you my account of human rights, but more importantly, I want to emphasize that uh, there's room for a variety of um, plausible accounts of human rights, and mine is just one. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, I want to talk about three different uh, approaches to human rights. So some of you may know that Charles Bites um, just published a book with Princeton. might have been the last year, might have been this year, but anyway, in the last 12 months, uh, arguing for a practical approach over what he calls the naturalistic and the agreement theories. Uh, and so what I want to do tomorrow is talk about the relative merits, the strengths and weaknesses of the naturalistic approach, the agreement theories, and then Bites' his own uh, practical approach. On Thursday afternoon, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about uh, negative and positive rights because there's been an enormous amount of discussion uh, about uh, the, the plausibility of positive rights, and if so, how they should be understood. And then Friday, unfortunately, you're stuck with me all day. Russ will leave. Uh, I will be here all morning and in the afternoon. And so in the morning, um, the main thing that I would like us to do is I'd like us to think about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At this point, we will have done a lot of thinking about human rights, uh, about what they are and what their content is, and it will be interesting for us to decide, are there some things that the Declaration left out? Would we add some rights to, to, to human rights to the Declaration? Or are there some rights on the Declaration which we would delete? And to motivate that, uh, I will begin the day Friday by uh, giving you an argument that there is no human right to democracy. Uh, and then uh, to give you a sense of how you might argue that uh, something which most people think there is a human right to is not a human right to, 
will probably, um, uh, uh, my guess is there'll be a lot of criticism of that. But the point of that is just to get us started to thinking about how what we might add and delete, um, and then um, we'll think more broadly about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then Friday afternoon, I want to talk about the connection between human rights and state sovereignty, um, uh, which is something that Rawls and others um, uh, discuss. And um, I will flesh out what the implications should be, in my view, for state sovereignty if you take human rights seriously. Okay. So let's get back to today, and the, the first thing, before I introduce my account of human rights, I want to suggest that uh, there are loads of different accounts of human rights, uh, and, they, um, and there's, uh, some of them may be right and wrong, but there may be multiple ones uh, from which you can choose depending upon your values or what you're trying to emphasize. And this list of 11 things here is to give you a sense of some of the issues uh, about which there's not just disagreement, but I think there's reasonable disagreement. And so I'll go through these, uh, hopefully, relatively quickly, um, and then I'll introduce my uh, account, and then we'll break into groups. Okay, so before we even get to human rights, I want to I point out that there are um, huge debates within rights theory um, that, uh, and there's room for reasonable people to disagree about what even, even a right is, okay? So you might be tempted to think, well, a right is just the opposite of a duty, right? If, there's, if somebody has a duty, then somebody else has a right. But this clearly is too quick, okay? So imagine, for instance, that Sergei decides that it's too hot up here, he wants to get some fresh air. Before Sergei leaves, he says, Kit, promise me you'll save my chair for me, okay? I say, I promise. Sergei leaves. I have a duty regarding the chair. Does the chair have a right? No, okay? The chair doesn't have a right even though I have a duty regarding it. I have a duty regarding the chair, but the duty is to Sergei, okay? Uh, and does Sergei have a right? And most people would say, yes, Sergei does have a right, okay? And so the point is that we can't just uh, infer from a duty that there's a right. It looks like it has to be a duty to somebody. And different theorists give different accounts of what it is for there to be what's called a relational duty, a duty which is to somebody or something. So to continue with this example, if I have a, a duty um, to um, Sergei to save his chair for him, the duty is regarding the chair, and it's a relational duty, but it's not related in the right way to the chair, it's related to Sergei. So the, a lot of people think the key question to, to rights is to figure out what makes a duty relational. And there are two types of theories. There are interest theories and there are will theories. Okay? Um, and so let me talk about those, and then maybe we can take a quick uh, break and see if people want to talk about anything in Russian. But the, the will theory and the interest theory. So the one standard way to go is to say the reason why a chair cannot have a right is because it has no interests. Sergei has interests. In this case, he's got a protected interest because I promised him. The promise protects his interest. And it's because Sergei's interests are protected that Sergei uh, has the right in this case. So an interest theorist of rights is going to say that the right holder is the person whose interest is protected. Chairs don't have interests. Chairs can't have interests protected. They can't be right holders. Sounds good. But there's a whole other school of thought which says, no, 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 there's, some, there's something important about rights in addition to duties. And that's the freedom and control you have over the duty. Notice, for instance, if Sergei comes up and says to, to me, uh, you know, it, it's too hot and you're too boring, I'm not coming back to my chair, uh, you don't need to save my chair for me anymore. 
He's released me from my promise. He's waived my duty, and I no longer have a duty. So notice, Sergei's got that control over my duty. He can claim or waive the duty. All right? And so it's his will, or it's his choice, as to whether my duty persists or not. And that's what's special about rights, according to will theorists. It's not that Sergei's interests is, are protected, it's that his will is protected. And so in a potential conflict of wills between Sergei and me, Sergei's will is privileged, and it's up to Sergei whether I have to save his chair for him or not. Okay. Now, those are the two theories, and notice that there are advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantages to a will theory is that it, it adds something important to duties, right? It's, it's say, oh, we've got the language of duties to explain Kit's obligation, but if we want another term to explain Sergei's control over my obligation, that's the language of rights. So we get greater theoretical clarity if we've got uh, not just duties, but also talk of rights, where rights are protected wills. So it looks like you should be a will theorist, not an interest theorist. The problem for a will theorist, though, is that if you have to have a, a will in order to be a right holder, then non-human animals can't have rights. Babies cannot have rights. And a lot of people think that's crazy, right? To, to say, because of my account of rights, a baby doesn't have rights. If I were to light my baby on fire, everyone agrees that would violate her rights. So the will theorist has an important advantage uh, insofar as it, it gives us greater theoretical clarity and focuses upon Sergei's control over my will. Uh, but it has the disadvantage that it seems to rule out as potential right holders things which are obviously seem to have rights. And then, of course, uh, interest theories have the opposite. Interest theorists don't seem to um, add as much to our theoretical understanding. Uh, they don't add much above duties. But on the other hand, they allow us to include all the potential right holders. So what we have, even before we get to human rights, when we're just talking about rights theory, we've got this classic divide. And this is the key. The will theorist can't say to the interest theorist, you're wrong. And the interest theorist can't say to the will theorist, you're wrong. It depends what you value more. If you value uh, theoretical clarity more, and this conceptual insight about the control over the will, then you're going to be drawn to will theorists, and then you're going to have to give some other account about animals and babies. If, on the other hand, what you're interested in making sure you've got all the right holders that we pre-theoretically think are right holders, then that's going to motivate you. So it depends what your motivations are. Uh, and this is, this is why we have had, for decades, debates between interest theorists and will theorists about rights. Um, yeah. Yes, Professor Wallman, could you please again say why babies, according to <coughs> will theorists, right, do not have rights to marriage? Good. So, um, according to a will theorist, to have a right is to have a protected will. What that means in the case of Ser if Sergei promises, if I promise Sergei that I will um, save the chair for him. Whether or not I have a duty depends upon his will, which is to say whether he claims or waives his right to that chair. So his will uh, is privileged over mine. And will theorists think that's what's special about rights, is that uh, Sergei can claim and waive, and I either have a duty or don't have a duty. Okay? But if that's true, then anything which can't claim and waive like a dog or an infant, can't either doesn't have a will or can't express it, can't be a right holder. And the baby, uh, baby has a will. 
Okay. Right. It, but it, it can't exercise the moral power over my duties, right? Mm -hmm. So there's nothing that the baby, uh, there's nothing that the baby can communicate mm -hmm. to re to relieve me of of my duty, right? So let's imagine that I have a a, a newborn baby, and I have a, a a wife, okay? And I say. Um, I want to go over to the Ukraine to talk about human rights for a week. What this means is that I'm going to be gone, uh, and the two of you are going to get much less sleep and be much less comfortable. Okay? My wife can say, uh, and let's say they have a, a right to a certain level of comfort. It's a crazy example, but whatever. My wife can say, that's all right. I know how much you love talking about human rights. Go to the Ukraine. I'll suffer through it. Okay? But there's nothing that my baby can do to waive. Um, yes, sir. Right. I agree with you, but uh, this is, this means only to say that he, the baby, has undeveloped will, not as good will as not as big will as we have it. That's fine. Because, for example, you can, you can have a baby. You come to it, but she or he wants to eat. Right. And then you have a uh, a duty to feed it. Right. Then you come, you go to the kitchen, you come back, the baby is asleep. You are waved. Um, it may be that, it, you're absolutely right that depending upon how an animal acts or how a baby acts, uh, you may have a, uh, a duty which either is initiated or extinguished. But it's not uh, by act of a will, right? It's not because... Uh, the baby can uh, say something to release the me. The baby can say, I don't want to eat. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want you to have a Oh, sure, sure. If the baby's old enough, right, babies develop, right? So a will, a will theorist will take the view, right? The, I mean, one, one standard response of a will theorist is to say, well, do babies have duties? No. As they develop, they acquire duties. So maybe just as babies develop, they acquire rights. So as they get older and they say, and they're able to say, no, 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 I don't want food, then they have a will which they can express and they can have the control. And then we might have a more difficult example with uh, prisoners, for example. Mm -hmm. They do have a developed will, very powerful will perhaps, uh -huh. but it's limited. It's limited. By the state, by the, law. By the penitentiary, by the law. So right. what about... Their case, do they have human rights? Um, well, that's some, another thing that's on the list is whether you can alienate these rights. And so one of the things that, uh, and you can alienate either by waiving or by forfeiting, right? And so some people think that there are certain rights that can be forfeited and other people don't. And some people think that human rights can't be forfeited. So that's another great question. But these are the point is these are going to be questions about which I think reasonable people can disagree. Okay, all of this is before we get to human rights. So let me pause, and if there's anything that anybody wants uh, to talk about, or if we're all good, I'll move on. Okay? All right. So now notice what happens. Is, this is a, a, a caricature. I'm going to talk about the human rights movement. Okay? Uh, and this is um, an oversimplification. But much of the human rights movement was a response to the atrocities of Nazi Germany in World War II. Okay? And so think, for instance, um, the way medicine changed. I can tell you the way medicine changed in the United States after World War II. Before World War II, the idea was that doctors had duties to be good doctors to their patients. And so the doctor had a duty to be the best doctor she could be. All right? But there was no talk of rights. There was no talk about the patient having rights. It was the, the doctor's duty to provide the best care she could. After this, when you had horrific uh, experimentation on human subjects without their permission in the Nazi regime, there was a transformation, and people in medicine started thinking of the patients as a right holder, and as the doctor who may or may not uh, help, depending upon whether the patient um, gave permission. 
okay? So the patient would have a right, and the doctor shouldn't do anything to the patient unless the patient gave her informed consent. So there was a shift. It wasn't just thinking about doctor's um, duties. There was a shift to thinking about the patient's rights. Again, this is an oversimplification, but I think a similar thing happened in terms of our understanding of states. For the most part, um, the pre-World War II understanding was what some people call a Westphalian understanding, uh, named after the Peace of Westphalia. And the idea was whatever uh, a state should not um, be aggressive against other states. But whatever a state did internally was the state's business. It was an internal matter, and other states should leave it alone. We had ideas about good or bad states. We had ideas about uh, the way states should operate. But we didn't talk about the rights of the constituents, certainly from the outside. The human rights movement, I think, was a, just like medicine had a, a shift in the way you understand it. The human rights movement was an idea that um, the, just as the doctor is bound by the patient's rights, states are bound by their citizens' rights. Okay? Uh, and so we had all kinds of international legal treaties drawn up. The most significant by far is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this was saying to countries, right, that in order to be legitimate, in order for you to have state sovereignty, you need to respect and protect these rights from your constituents. So there was a, a, an enormous body of international law created. This is human rights law. All right? So now things are complicated because when you talk about human rights, are you talking about moral rights or are you talking about legal rights? Okay? Um, and you can talk about either, but you just need to be clear. If you're talking about moral rights, some people might say, well, I don't want to talk about moral rights because I want to talk about what actually you're legally protected to do. So 200 years ago in the United States, there might have been a moral right not to be enslaved, but there was no legal right against slavery. And so some people say, well, I don't worry about moral rights. I want to know what the legal rights are. Other people say, no, I want to focus on moral rights, because whatever the law happens to be, we should be able to criticize the law. So 200 years ago, we might want to be able to criticize the United States because of the institution of slavery. You can't do that unless you're positing a moral right. Um, so it's fine when you're talking about human rights to be talking about legal rights. And it's fine to be talking about moral rights. Um, if, and this is what Russ is focusing on the next two days, if there are such things as moral rights or there are human rights, okay? But you need to be clear. I, as you'll see, my definition, I focus on moral rights. That doesn't mean someone's wrong to focus on legal rights. Next question has to do with state sovereignty. Is there, is there a direct connection between human rights and state sovereignty? Okay? Um, people agree and disagree, uh, disagree about this. So that's like, uh, for instance, John Rawls in The Law of Peoples emphasizes that human rights are those things that a state needs to protect and respect if it's going to enjoy its sovereignty. All right? Now, you might think, well, this, doesn't, this isn't an issue for human rights. This is just an account of, what you're, of political legitimacy. Right? But it has implications for your account of human rights, because Rawls gives a very short list of human rights. There's no right to equality, there's no right to political participation, uh, certainly no right to democracy, things like this. Why? Well, it's because he connects human rights to state sovereignty. And he wants to say, if you violate a human right, um, then uh, we can intervene in your country, uh, maybe even militarily. And given that he doesn't want uh, intervention, very much intervention, he's going to reduce the list to a very small list. 
So other people say, no, no, the list of human rights is much bigger, and so maybe they want to separate it from state sovereignty. Yes, could, could you again clarify? State. Why if we don't protect human rights, we don't have sovereignty? I mean, the state. Again, right. Could you? Yeah. So the idea is that, and we'll talk. Legitimacy or sovereignty. You're right. So um, I, I'll talk about this a lot more on Friday afternoon. But, no, no, but the idea is when I use sovereignty and legitimacy, legitimacy, I use them interchangeably. And the idea is. It's a moral right to self-determination, okay? So <clears throat> the United States has a problem with racism, okay? The whites and blacks are treated very differently in the United States. Suppose the Ukraine has a solution, and they want to come in and they want to say, we will impose upon the United States a more racially balanced order. Does the United States have a right to say to the Ukraine, um, stay out. This is an internal matter. Right? Uh, that's the question of sovereignty. And some people think that whether or not a country is sovereign depends upon its human rights record. Okay? Mm -hmm. And if it adequately, who knows what adequately means, but if it adequately protects human rights, then the Ukraine could give advice, but they can't for, uh, forcibly interfere. Okay, so um, it's standard to think that legitimate states are entitled to self-determination. The question, and again this is a question I'll talk about more on Friday, is whether we should understand legitimacy uh, as saying that only states which uh, protect, adequately protect human rights are legitimate. So it depends how you understand legitimacy. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. Negative and positive rights. I know Russ talked about this, and we're going to talk about this a lot on Thursday. Um, very briefly, as, as Russ said, the idea of a negative right is a right to be left alone. If I have a negative right, then it just means you ought not to interfere with me. If I have a positive right, then I have a right to some kind of assistance from me. You have to do something, right? So if, there, if I have only a negative right not to be tortured, for instance, that just means none of you can torture me. If I have a positive right to health care, on the other hand, then at least some other person presumably has a duty to help provide me with health care. A lot, not everybody, but a lot of people are skeptical that there can be positive human rights precisely because of this question of duty bearers. If there is a positive right, who has the duty to supply it? Okay? There's controversy about it. I won't go into a great detail because we're going to talk about this on Thursday. But the, the basic line for people who deny positive rights goes like this. If it's a human right, every human has it, and it holds against every other human. That means that if I have a positive right, that means every other human has a duty to supply it. That means if some child is starving in sub-Saharan Africa and she's got a right to minimal subsistence, she has a right not to starve to death, then it means everybody in the world has a duty um, to um, make sure that she doesn't starve to death. But that seems crazy. So there can't be positive human rights. Other people who think there are positive rights are going to have to come back and they're going to have to either say, yes, we all have a duty, or they're going to have to give some kind of account about how duties are assigned consistent with human rights. But that's a matter of debate. Okay. Another matter of debate is whether we should understand human rights to be interactional or institutional. Okay. Thomas Poggy is somebody who's been pushing recently for an institutional understanding of human rights. He's actually in his latest edition of World Poverty and Human Rights, he's retreated from that some. Uh, but here's the, the general idea, and we'll talk about this more on Thursday as well. Go back to my right um, to not be tortured, okay? Let's imagine that I live, um, if, if it's an interactional thing, if I have a right not to be tortured, 
All that means is that each of you has a duty not to torture me. And if my right, and if none of you tortures me, then my right not to be tortured has been respected. If anyone tortures me, my right has been violated. Poggy and others think, no, no, we should think institutionally. And what this means is we should think about human rights being fulfilled or unfulfilled. And it's really a question about does, do the institutions adequately protect you against torture? So think of somebody in Norway, for instance. Norway's got a, a well-functioning government which adequately protects people from being tortured. So um, it's, when we talk about human rights, we're principally talking about institutions. Since those institutions are in place, all those human rights in Norway are being fulfilled, even if someone gets tortured, right? If Sergei sneaks in at night, ties me up, and tortures me, right? That may be a rights violation, but we, if it happens in Norway, where people are generally secure, they have secure access uh, not to be tortured, right? Then uh, we don't talk about my right being unfulfilled. So the question is, do we, do we um, focus on individual interactions, the way most people have, or should we look at institutions? One of the reasons people think that we've got to make this institutional term, again, is think about what's happened uh, with the human rights movement. The, the addressees, many people think, first and foremost for human rights are what? Governments, right? We're saying to governments, you need to respect and protect these rights. Okay? When we draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we're saying to states, these, these are the rights you need to protect. And so once we're talking about human rights, some people think we should think institutionally, not interaction. Yep? Could you clarify on that point? Are we talking about rights or about the criteria of violation of rights? We're talking about both. Because uh, if I understand uh, the criteria of violation, but I know, I don't quite understand the uh, characteristic of right through that. Through this, this one? No, for, for interaction. The, the whole distinction, according to the right, but not to a violation of right. I understand violation. Okay. So, so yeah. So the interactional will talk about violations and non-violations. The institutional will talk about rights fulfillment rather than violation. Um, and so what, uh, what a human right is, a human right on the institutional, so I'll just give you an example. On in an interactional model, to say that I have a human right not to be tortured is just to say that each of you has a duty not to torture me. Mm -hmm. And my right is not violated if nobody tortures me. On the institutional model, to say that there's a human right not to be tortured, it's to say that I have a right that the institutions imposed upon me satisfactorily protect me against torture. Mm -hmm. That's the content. Yeah. I don't want to repeat it, but I have to. I think we add here some part of confusion. Okay. For instance, you gave us the right for not to be tortured. Okay. Who is addressing of you? Not we. Okay. If we are going to torture. Who is the addressee? Yes. Not we. Is the government. I mean, this right not to be imposed on the torture. Is addressed to the government. If I'm going to torture you, which part of the legislation is going to prevent it? Criminal law. And is, if I'm going to talk about the articles of the criminal law, it's the articles, you know, about uh, the president, and Nancy and Chashka will be died, and Tomato will be died, whatever. Uh, sorry for Russian. Okay. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> and I think that this adds a part of this confusion. I mean, we should narrow the application of human rights. Okay. This is for public officials. I mean, this. Uh, According to the institutional, institutional model, system. it's first and foremost for public officials. According to the interactional model, the addressee is everybody in the world. Okay, and so that's why the institutional model says if Sergei's not an official, if Sergei's the chief of police, and he comes in and tortures me, and he routinely tortures people who are political um, in a political minority then um, the institutions are not uh, fulfilling their human right. But according to the institutional model, if Sergei just happens to like to torture people, and he comes in and he's just an individual citizen and tortures me, it's not a human rights issue. So you're absolutely right. They're different addressees. 
All right, this, I'm taking longer than I'd hoped, so let me go through these next more quickly, and I think I can. Okay. Are human rights absolute, or are they defeasible? Okay. Absolute is this. So the general idea behind a right, typically, is that they are resistant to utilitarian calculus, which is to say, so for instance, let's say I have a right not to be tortured, and I don't like being tortured, but I don't mind it that much. Sergei loves to torture people. Okay? <laughs> so Sergei is going to get a great deal of happiness out of torturing me. I'm going to get a little bit of unhappiness about torturing me, being tortured. Is it okay for him to torture me? No, of course not. Right? The point of having a right is that you can stand on it even when uh, it wouldn't maximize overall welfare. So we generally think that they're not easily defeasible, okay? But it's controversial whether they're absolute or not. What if the only way to save the world from a nuclear holocaust would be for a surrogate to torture me? An absolutist would say, he still shouldn't torture me. Other people say, well, you have a right, and he shouldn't torture you just for fun, but if it's necessary to save the world, your right is defeasible. Again, these are things about which reasonable people can disagree. Alienability. This has already been raised. Can you waive your human rights? All right? Like the right to life. So say, um, Sergei, I'm going to pick on you all day if that's okay. Okay. Sergei is a sadist. I'm a masochist. There was a case like this in Germany, right? That some of you may have heard about a few years ago where a guy went online, found another guy um, who, he would go online and try and find people who wanted to be killed uh, for a sexual kick. And so what he'd do is he'd bring the person in and they'd, uh, he'd beat the person and stuff like that. And he'd say, you sure you want me to kill you? Videotape it all. You sure you want me to kill me? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the last second, people would say no. And so he'd stop. He'd let them go. But he finally found one person uh, and uh, I mean, this is real, a true story, right? So the, the first thing they did is they cut off his penis uh, and they cooked it and they ate it together. Um, and then they went forward and they said, uh, and, and he said, now I'm going to kill you. And the man said, okay. And uh, all on videotape. Uh, and uh, so the sadist killed the masochist, right? And then the question is, was this murder? The guy had waived his right. And the, and the defendant, the person who had killed the person, had all these tapes to document that every time that somebody had said no, he'd let him go, right? Uh, and it was only in this case because the guy consented. And so if you think that you can waive even your, all of your rights, then you think that there, this guy did nothing wrong. But if you think, no, no, there's some rights, maybe human rights you can't waive, then it would be impermissible. So that's something that people disagree about. Also, as was brought up, there's a question about prisoners and what you can forfeit. Okay? So the United States, for instance, is routinely criticized on human rights ground because it has capital punishment. Right? So the idea is that if you, um, no matter how badly, no matter how criminally you act, you can't forfeit the right to life. And if you can't, because that's the type of thing that is inalienable. You can't forfeit. And if so, then the United States uh, is uh, violating a human right even when it, uh, say, kills a convicted murderer. Okay? So people disagree about this, about whether you can waive some or all of your rights or whether you can forfeit some or all of your rights. Did you, did she have her hand up? No. Okay. What's the name of the case? Uh, I don't know. I'll find it on the internet. Um, but you can Google, uh, if you've got Wi-Fi, you can Google um, German uh, computer programmer uh, sex crime. Sex what? Sex crime or sexual murder. And I, I bet it will come up. And if you can't find it, I'll find it. So it was a celebr. I think it was about six, seven years ago. It was a a celebrate, internationally celebrated case. Uh, and the courts didn't know what to do because it was murder because 
um, they, the German law doesn't make an exception for consent. Uh, but on the other hand, it was clearly consensual. Okay. Other questions. Are human rights timeless or are they temporally contextual? That's a fancy term. What that means is when we're talking about human rights, are we talking about the rights that people have now in modern society? Or are we talking about what they've had and will always have? Now some people think they've got to be timeless because we're talking about rights that humans have as humans. And since being human doesn't change, your rights shouldn't change. But if you look at things in the, uh, like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, when you look at the, the documents, they say things like right to education, right to minimally adequate health care, right to due process. These rights don't make sense 200 years ago. Okay? What they're trying to do is they're trying to protect people against the standard threats in modern society. Okay? So um, it's a question. Some people think that uh, if we're talking about rights that humans have just in virtue of being human, then they should always have them because they're always human. Being human doesn't change. Other people say, no, it depends upon what sort of uh, threats you face at the time. Similarly, are they universal or are they spatially or nationally contextual? So, for instance, Canada is able to give a certain level of health care to all of its citizens. Chad is not. Some, right? So the question is, do we want to say that, the, the human, that there's a human right to health care in Canada but not in Chad? Some people want to say, of course not. If it's a human right, it should be universal. It should be everywhere. Other people say, no, if we're holding countries accountable, how can we hold Chad to the same level of accountability as Canada uh, when Chad just simply doesn't have the resources? There's no way they can do that. So um, how are we flexible or completely unflexible about our understanding of the human rights depending upon uh, geography or nationality? Two last quick things, and then I'll give you my account and we'll break Okay, um, into groups. Are we talking about, are human rights a threshold or are they comparative? Most pe what this means, most people think that human rights, a threshold is to say it's a, it's a, a floor that you may not go below, right? And so it's the idea that um, you have a minimally decent human life, for instance. And there's certain things um, which have to do, uh, if, as long as you're above that, then your rights aren't violated. If you're not being tortured, if you're not hungry, if you're educated, if you're healthy and safe, your human rights are satisfied. And here's the key. It doesn't matter how much poorer you are than other people. Okay? If you think it's comparative, on the other hand, for instance, you, maybe you think that human rights are about dignity. And you think that dignity is essentially a comparative notion. So that, for instance, if I have this much income, but my fellow citizens have this much income, then my life is not dignified. Whereas if my fellow citizens had only this much income, my life would be dignified. Right? So, are, is, is, to put it in terms of my hands, right? The threshold person is going to say, as long as you're above a certain level, your human rights aren't violated. Comparative people would say, not necessarily. How are your fellow citizens? If, if your fellow citizens are this much better off, if they compare, if you compare very poorly to them, then maybe your life is not dignified uh, because of that comparison and your human rights are violated. Last question is whether any group rights are human rights. Most, for the, again, for the most part, the human rights documents and the human rights theorists focus upon individual rights. The one exception, and this is not surprising, is the African community, right? So if you look at the African Union and you look at their human rights documents, they include things like the right not to be colonized. They say that's a human right. Given their history, it's understandable that they would be very concerned about groups' rights to self-government. Not just individuals, but a group right to self-government. Also, the way that the colonies have uh, taken their natural resources, 
the African Union and their documents talk about the group rights of a people to the exclusive use and decision about their natural resources, whether that be gold or oil or whatever. Right? And so the African, and understandably given their history, the African um, uh, Union advocates group rights in their human rights documents. Most people think now human rights are what individuals have as humans. Okay, I'm sorry this went on so long, but this is just to show you that these are issues that um, there's not necessarily one clear answer to. And depending upon how you answer these things, you're going to have a different account of human rights. So, yeah. Is it alien, 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 uh, alienable? Alienable. and is it the same as the feasible? The feasible? Is that, yeah. Is that the no. same, same distinction? Or we just skip it? No. Um, alienability covers two things. Whether you can waive a right and whether you can forfeit a right. Forfeit? Forfeit is when you do something badly, right? Um, and, um, uh, and so then you no longer have a right. So for instance, um, uh, say I sell shirts to Sarah. Oh, forfeit. forfeit, right? And every week I bring him 10 shirts, he gives me uh, $10, right? Uh, but then I don't bring, if I don't bring the shirts, I forfeit my right to the $10. And in criminal call, some people think, for instance, the reason why there's a human right to free movement, which seems incompatible with putting someone in prison. So if, if the government just came and randomly grabbed people and put them in prison, we would object and we'd say, that's a violation of the human right to free movement. But if the government only put people who had been duly convicted of crimes in prison, maybe that's not a human rights violation because those people had forfeited their right to free movement. Okay, so I don't know if you can see this. This is what I mean by human rights. For the rest of the week, unless I say otherwise, uh, this is a uh, human rights. So I think that human rights are a subset of moral rights. And they're distinguished based upon their connection to basic human interests, or better yet, basic uh, human needs. Is this a personal so, point? Pardon me? Is it a personal point? This is my personal view of human rights. This is what I mean by human rights. Okay? So human rights are individual moral rights to the protections generally needed against the standard and direct threats to leading a minimally decent human life in modern society. Okay? I'm not saying you should accept this, right? I've just tried to explain why it's so controversial. So look at, look at, what, uh, look at the elements here before we break into groups. The first thing I say is they're individual rights. So in my view, group rights can't be human rights. Okay? That might be wrong. Second of all, I'm saying that they're moral rights. I'm not talking about legal rights. I know that there's a, a human rights literature out there. But when I talk about it, I'm talking about moral rights. And the reason I focus on moral rights is because I want to be in a position to criticize political institutions. I want to be in a position to criticize the United States or other governments, depending upon how whether they respect the moral rights. And I want to do this regardless of what it says in the documents. Okay? So those, those are two controversial things. It's individuals and it's moral. Okay? Why do I say generally needed? Okay, um, because if somebody has extraordinary needs or is uh, extraordinarily unfortunate, right, I'm not sure it's a human rights violation. So, for instance, if someone gets struck by lightning and killed, I don't want to blame the state and say, you know, their right to life, you didn't protect them against being struck by lightning. Okay, so it's the type of things we generally need. Um, now, this is key against the standard threats. Same thing. What happened after World War II is there was a lot of thought about what happened to the persecutions of the Jews and others. Okay? Um, and so um, the drafters of these documents tried to think, what are the types of things that we need to worry about? That states uh, either should protect us from or that states might do to us, right? And so we just come up with the standard 
uh, worries. So again, we're not worried about someone being struck by lightning, right? Um, and the other thing about generally needed and standard is that I don't want to have a, I don't want to say the things you definitely need, right? Because somebody might get tortured and still live a decent life. Think about Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela spent a, a, a number of years, uh, wrongly I think, imprisoned in South Actually, Africa. Actually, he graduated. He became a lawyer in the prison. Right, but he was also tortured. Right. Now here's the question: Am I going to be committed to saying he he has not had a minimally decent life? Not in the moment, perhaps. Right. Well, so my view is that you you might have these extraordinary individuals who lead quite gracious lives. Okay even though they're tortured. But you still want to be able to say that there's a human right not to be tortured. So you want to say they're generally needed as a standard. And why do I say direct? This is the only thing, so this is a pretty standard definition. This direct is the only uh, thing which, which is a word which is not, I think, in any other definition of human rights that I know. And I'll talk about this more on Friday morning. The reason I put direct in there is in order to avoid human rights prolifer proliferation. Because if we start trying to protect even against indirect threats, then it seems like we can include all too much stuff. All right, But that's going to be controversial. And then um, two, uh, two, well, three more things. One is what's doing a lot of the work is minimally decent. Okay, So I say, for me, it's just a threshold. Right? There's a certain type of human life which is minimally decent. We might have an enormous disagreement about what the good human life is, what the excellent human life is. But presumably there's a lot of agreement, not consensus, but there's a lot of agreement about what the minimally decent life is. And that seems particularly urgent and more clear. Right? And so these, uh, this is, I think, because I think human rights are particularly urgent, that's why minimal decency is in here. And the other thing is, I personally want to tie human rights to sovereignty. I want to say that sovereign governments are, leg governments are legitimate just in case they adequately respect and protect human rights. And so that's why I want this in here. Finally, a human life in modern society. This is temporally contextual, which is to say it's not timeless. So uh, the thing is that we want to look around now and we want to say, what are the threats now and for the foreseeable future, for the next 50 years, say, to living a human life? And so on my view, our list of human rights may evolve. It may, uh, some, hu some things which are currently human rights may cease to be human rights as those threats are eliminated. Or some things which weren't human rights may become human rights as threats become standard, right? So there are a number of controversial uh, elements to this. Now what I suggest is we break into groups of five. Say, so, well, how many are there? I'll have groups of five, okay? Uh, and I'll uh, just count those off. And here's what I want um, each group to think about, okay? In light of, uh, in light of the, 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 the types of questions are, what do you want out of an account of human rights? Again, what do you want? What, what do you want your account of human rights to do? So my account of human rights is the way it is, for instance, because for me, the fundamental thing I'm interested in an account of human rights is explaining state legitimacy and when we can criticize, when we can interfere with other states. You might, on the other hand, you might say, my account, what I want an account of human rights is I want an account which best captures the legal practice. If that's, if that's the case, right off the bat, you're not going to say moral rights, you're going to say legal rights. So you might have different aims. Why are you interested in human rights? If you have no interest in human rights, you're not going to want an account. But depending upon what work, what function you want your account of human rights to be, it's going to be different. Okay, so the first question is, why do you want an account of human rights? And these are things that 
people in your group may disagree about, and that's fine, because there aren't right or wrong answers. As a consequence, what is your account of human rights? What is a human right? So here's my account. And third, come up with some reasons why this is wrong. What's wrong with this account? What should be changed? <laughs>